All right, let's get going. Um, hello, everyone. Allow me to just do a very quick introduction. We've got Ryan Murray here from Dremio. He's got a great talk uh, for you, so let's dive right in and get going. Hey, guys. Uh, thanks a lot, Jason. So, um, yeah, I guess first off, I'd like to thank everyone for coming. It's pretty awesome to see so many people uh, showing up to this, especially on the uh, on the web like this. And obviously, thanks thanks for the invite to the to the organizers. I think it's the lineup at this conference is pretty amazing, and I'm excited to be part of it. So I don't have much time. I guess let's dive right in. Um, as you can see, the title is "Building an Efficient Data Lake Data Pipeline for Data Intensive Workloads." What I really want to talk about today is um, kind of building on some of the stuff Wes was talking about. How can we use uh, Apache Aeroflight to do really cool, really interesting, really new things that um, have previously been hard to do or downright impossible? So I know I'm sure a lot of you were in Wes's talk, so I don't want to spend too much time on what is Aero and what is flight, but I thought it'd be really good just to level set for the people who weren't in the call and for people who were... Um, who just wanted a bit more clarification. So simply put, Arrow is a columnar data format for high performance data analytics. Well, what does that mean exactly? I think there's two main things in Arrow that um, make it so special and make it um, worth talking about. And the first thing is this columnar format. The columnar format is really what allows us to do uh, really high performance uh, calculations on very large data sets. And uh, the second is it's, um, it's a lingua franca. So when everyone's uh, using Arrow, everyone can talk Arrow and everyone can share data, that reduces the time spent with, um, with having to write all the different communication layers and it allows for every tool that I build and open source you can use. And we can really build a whole uh, set of tools around Arrow. So getting a bit more specific, uh, what is Arrow? I like to think of what is Arrow and what isn't it Arrow. As I started off saying, it's it's really at its base, just a specification at that outlines how to store memory, uh, how to store data in memory. And the key component of this is the columnar data set. The specification is based around how to make um, this data very efficient for analytical processing on CPUs, GPUs, and even some new um, some of the new, more interesting uh, data architectures, so we can think about doing really interesting things on FPGAs. I think there's a there's a couple of people who have been doing FPGA work with Arrow. So it's really saying how do we how are these new data architectures um, processing data, and how can we represent our data best to take advantage of that? So once we have that uh, specification in place, we can start building a set of libraries and tools around it. And uh, again, as era, as Wes alluded to, there's a lot of a lot of people building a lot of different tools in a lot of different languages. So people can manipulate and exchange arrow buffers very easily, regardless of what platform you're on. And then finally, it's a it's a set of standards again to make uh, analytical data transportable. Meaning, how do we share this data between processes and between um, between consumers? And that's really where Aeroflight comes in. Just really quickly, what it isn't is it's not an installable system. You don't go to the Aero website, download it, install it, and run it. Similarly, it's not a cache or a grid or anything like that, though you can use Aero as a, as a Lego brick to build a system like that. Um, I think it's also worth noting that it's not really designed for streaming applications. The power of Aero's columnar data storage format makes um, appending or inserting rather cumbersome. And the the columnar format really doesn't have any value if you're, say, pushing around a single record. So that's that's an important aspect when you're thinking about designing new systems is you want to be moving around blocks of Aero data. And uh, just want to take a quick look at the columnar format when we talk about Aero's columnar data structures. Um, we have two two diagrams here. We have the what Arrow, what a traditional database would hold uh, data like and how Arrow holds uh, data in memory. So traditionally you'd hold things uh, row wise. And again, as I said, that makes appending data, inserting data, removing data very fast. But it's very hard to say, compute the average of session ID. You have to 
read the first element out of row one, then you have to calculate where row two starts, read that element, move through the data structure, and you end up having to scan the entire data structure just to read those four or five rows. And then the power of the columnar data format is all of those session IDs are in a contiguous block of memory. So you, that's where you're able to take advantage of the way that GPUs work, the way that uh, modern CPUs work with pipelining and SIMD and this kind of stuff. So for example, SIMD calculations require uh, your data to be contiguous. So for uh, doing a computation on session ID, you can use uh, one SIMD instruction instead of say four or 10 or 18 or however many um, instructions, single instructions on the CPU to, to calculate uh, on, on session ID. So that's a quick arrow primer. Um, let's move into arrow flight. So <clears throat> I think the, the important thing about arrow flight is it um, delivers on that interoperability promise that we were talking about with arrow uh, to its fullest extent. So now we're able to use an RPC mechanism to exchange data between um, between consumers, between servers and clients and this kind of stuff. So it's, um, you're able to do that in parallel and you're able to do that with large data sets. And that's something um, that has been traditionally hard, whether you're moving things with uh, REST API or through something custom or Thrift or JDBC or ODBC, there's a lot of effort spent moving data from one place to the other. I think, um, the stat I saw in Wes's talk was something like 80% of time is actually spent serializing, deserializing data. Whereas with, with Aeroflight, we're actually taking this data and we're um, putting it directly onto the network buffer. So we don't have to um, translate the data into something that the network can understand. So we're skipping that step. And then again, on the client side, the client is able to read directly off of the network buffer into its in-memory applications. Meaning again, we're not having to do any translation. And that's really going to speed up. Um, at the, then we're only really looking at the network time to move between to move data between two systems. So a large data set is really only constrained by the network. And um, again, because it's arrow and because of all the things that we find important in arrow, we uh, it's fully inter fully interoperable, <clears throat> excuse me fully interoperable, which is what we wanted when we first introduced Arrow, and it's cross-platform. Again, a very important thing for the Arrow community. Finally, it's built for security. It comes built in with, um, with SSL and with, uh, with authentication and things. And um, most importantly, it's built to be parallel. So this is um, a pretty interesting technique, and uh, we'll take a look at how the parallel streams work. But if you think of uh, a traditional context, like say a JDBC driver in Spark. You're going to have to, uh, in Spark, build all of your offsets, build, keep track of all of the accounting for all of your rows, and then spin off a dozen, two dozen, a thousand, whatever, JD, individual JDBC connections. Bring those results back from the JDBC server and compose them again in Spark. What Flight is really allowing you to do is to do that all in a single step as a native part of the Flight protocol. So if we want to call a, a data set flight a flight, then a flight is going to be composed of a set of streams. And each of those streams is going to have a flight endpoint. And those flight endpoints are really just a, it's going to be an opaque ticket, which um, you can redeem on a particular server for a particular part of the data set. And then it's going to come along with a consumption location as well. Currently, the uh, flight protocol is built on JDBC, so that consumption location is going to be an IP address or a DNS name or something. But you can imagine swapping out the gRPC uh, kit underneath and putting just about anything in, and then that endpoint is really a uh, more of an opaque concept of where you want to get the data from. And this allows you to take advantage of locality and make sure that your clients are as close as possible to your um, to your servers. So looking at that in practice, we can look at what would happen on a uh, Dremio system with a parallel flight uh, enabled. And here we have our coordinator, and we're going to run a get flight info, which could be a SQL statement or it could be a um, pointer to a data set or something. And that's going to return all important schema information and uh, a list of endpoints. And those endpoints, as I said, are your location information and your ticket. 
So now as a client, I have all the locations that I need to build this data set and all the tickets, and I can go out and start asking individual executors from Dremio to get that data. Now this, this endpoint concept is nice and flexible. If I'm a just a simple single-threaded Python client, then I can go and um, retrieve those in serial. I can ask for the first endpoint, second, third, and bring back that data and concatenate it locally. If I'm a multi-threaded application, then I could fire off all those do gets in parallel. Or if I'm something like Spark, a distributed system, then I can actually distribute those do gets to different um, executors on the Spark server. So there's a lot of flexibility in how we get the data back. And we're able to really take advantage of the parallelization inherent in distributed systems. So that's um, that's basically how Aeroflight works. I wanted to now talk about some of the things that we could possibly start thinking about doing with, with Flight. So what comes today with Flight is what I think of the Flight Starter Pack. And that's the primitive operations that uh, allow you to interact with a RPC server with Aeroflight. We can also think of a set of expansion packs. And these expansion packs are effectively um, a list of operations and add-ons to a flight server that allow it to do to fulfill a specific service. So the going back to the starter pack, the the primitives that we that we built into Arrow and are available in uh, in Arrow Flight as of I don't know version two versions ago, we have the do get and the do put, and those are those are simple get data from the server, push data to the server. Recently, we introduced a do exchange, and that's a bidirectional exchange that doesn't have to be. Um, that can be repeated. I can do a do get and then two do puts and then another do get, or I can mix that up interchangeably. Another very flexible option we have is the do action. And this can be um, basically anything that the server wants. You can give any number of actions and they can be as complicated or as simple as you want. So um, some simple things you can do is you can think of altering session parameters or setting server properties upon connection or stuff like that. Um, it's flexible enough that you could say, reformat your hard drive and reboot your computer as an action as well, if that was, if that was your thing. And then finally, we have the uh, list actions. And those things are listing the services available on the server, listing the actions, listing the data sets, this kind of stuff. And that's basically the uh, a low level, simple way of starting to discover what an arrow server can do. So now if we look at what can we build with, with these primitives, we can build some of these expansion packs. Some of the expansion packs I've been thinking of are um, an ETL expansion pack. So uh, you think of how Airflow works. Airflow is a directed acyclic graph of transformations to build an ETL pipeline. Well, what if rather than um, doing these transactions by reading from disk and then writing back to disk, these transactions were linked together as a set of flight services. In this case, I think of them as flight microservices. They're very small, very simple things that do one thing and do it well. And that decouples the system um, quite a bit. We can now advance these different things at different speeds. We can deploy different parts of the system at different times, um, write them in different languages, depending on what's most useful for us. So if we're able to um, turn our directed acyclic graph of ETL um, components into a um, into a set of these arrow linked microservices, then we lose a lot of the time spent writing to and reading from disk. We now are putting that into just transferring directly across the network. Similarly, we can use this uh, microservice concept when we start thinking about machine learning. So we can use microservices to distribute our feature engineering or our enrichment and transform stuff, uh, jobs. And we can think about um, training the model by farming out a set of um, parameters in a grid search to, um, to different um, flight services using, um, using flight. And, um, and then we have the option there of even using flight to query the server from the client to say, predict this, this matrix, and then sending back a vector of predictions, as opposed to doing that via REST or something more traditional. And finally, I wanted to talk a bit about what a SQL service would look like. So we've 
we've been talking for a while now about how Arrow has the potential, Aeroflight has the potential to rebuild um, uh, JDBC and ODBC. We can finally move out of the roadblock that JDBC and ODBC give us of um, having to translate all of our data before and after sending it across the network. So by building this SQL service as a set of actions on flight, we can start to emulate the patterns and the um, properties that we want out of our Aero flight service that we would need from our Aero flight service to actually replace something like ODBC and JDBC. So the first things we're gonna need is we're gonna need actions to help us explore our catalog more similarly to how JDBC and ODBC allow you to explore their catalog. So that's getting parts of namespaces looking at the whole database, treating an Aeroflight service as a database that has a set of tables on it. Similarly, we're going to need statements like prepare, um, prepare our SQL statements, execute our SQL statements, and these are going to be actions that take SQL and return, um, whether it's handlers to prepare statements or something like that. And we're also going to start building, um, we need to have a lot more support for session parameters and um, all the extra bits and bobs that a, a proper JDBC service would need. And it's not until we actually want to get our results that we return to our simple primitives in flight where we um, execute our SQL statement and uh, get a list of flight endpoints and then do a get, a, a do get on those to return our results. And now, now we're able to mimic something like JDBC and we're able to do that with our parallel do gets that we, that we worked so hard to build. And we can think about our machine learning pipeline. Um, so if we have a big Spark ML job, then we can get data from our cloud data lake through our cloud data lake engine, whether that's Dremio or something else. We can use our parallel do gets. So as we'll see in a benchmark in a little while, pulling data into Spark, you can um, pretty much saturate a, um, an EC2 instances network. So it's very quick to pull data out of the cloud data lake into Spark. And then in Spark, we can federate off a lot of our transformations and enrichments and feature engineering jobs off to a set of microservices. And maybe these microservices are just gonna multiply a vector by two. Maybe they're going to go off to a separate databases and enrich the data. Or there's plenty of complicated things we can do, but since they're all um, opaque and they're all isolated, it makes it very easy to evolve this as a productionized system. And then finally, once it's all trained and ready to go, our client can start um, asking the Spark ML engine to predict things for us. Traditionally, this has been done via REST and that's not a problem. It's not a very big data set, but I think it, it, um, it illustrates nicely how uh, flexible the flight uh, system is that we could actually do this all the way from client all the way to the back where we're actually training the model. So there's a lot of really interesting applications you can think of in, in there. And finally, here's a, an outline more of how I was thinking an ETL pipeline might work. So if we have a set of ETL jobs represented by these purple spheres, and these are just going to be simple operations, uh, again, enriching data, transforming, aggregating, and whatnot. And then rather than have uh, something like Airflow control all these individual jobs and their intermediate results stored on the data lake, we can think about using um, do put uh, primitive in, uh, in flight to actually moving this data down the, down the stream and fanning out calculations, bringing them back in, aggregating them, all this kind of stuff. And at this point, we, we would obviously want to add in checkpoints as well the sum of the intermediary stores we do want so we can drop this data onto the cloud data lake at the, at the right points for the checkpoints. And, um, and yeah, this gives us a lot more, I think this gives a lot more simplicity onto a complex ETL pipeline and it's certainly gonna add a lot of speed. So those are some of the ideas uh, about what I'm thinking about how we can build interesting flight data sets. Wanted to talk about something more concrete that we actually have done and are using, and that's the data source for Spark. So for those of you who aren't aware, Spark released a data source V2 uh, a couple of versions ago in Spark, and this sort of overhauled the way um, a, data, a database is able to interact with Spark. Before getting data from a database into Spark, involved having to know a lot of really intricate details about, about Spark. 
Now there's a really simple interface that you can build on. So we're able to use the columnar batch part of the V2 data source to keep these flight buffers in, uh, in arrow buffers and then pass those error buffers to Sparks engines. It also supports the uh, pushdowns of some primitive SQL thing, um, operations like filters and projects. So if we send a complicated uh, SQL statement from Spark to Dremio, most of that calculation will actually be pushed down into Dremio, re resulting in a smaller data set being returned to Spark. And finally, we have much more flexibility over partitioning in this new data source. So we're able to um, leverage our parallelism in, in Spark and in something like Dremio or another flight service by partitioning um, the data set on flight tickets. And you can see once this thing is on your Spark service, it's relatively easy to use, just sending SQL off to it and getting the response back. And finally, just to show some quick benchmarks of this thing running in real life. So we've got a four node EMR uh, cluster set up against a four node uh, Dremio cluster. And they're both using the same size machines. So uh, taking those two clusters, we set up a data set inside of Dremio and then issued a query with uh, the parallel flight service to Dremio from Spark. And did a, did a non-trivial calculation on it just to make sure Spark wasn't optimizing out actually fetching the data or not fetching all of it. So in this table, we can see all the different data sizes we tried from 100,000 rows up to a billion rows and uh, the different times that it took for different um, operations. So looking at JDBC, a serial flight connection, a parallel flight connection, and we did it again with parallel flight for eight nodes. So I think um, pointing out just the top and bottom numbers here, the top numbers are relatively the same. That just basically comes down to um, 100,000 rows isn't large enough to actually show the benefit of the parallel uh, spark, uh, parallel flight in this case. So there's more overhead to setting up and the cost of translating the data in the JDBC layer isn't as, uh, isn't as, um, isn't as noticeable with a lower, uh, lower number of data of rows. On the other hand, a billion rows, we can really see how performant flight can be. And in this case, for a uh, parallel flight with eight nodes, we're able to transfer a billion rows of data at, um, that's something like 50 gigabytes of data, I think, in under 20 seconds on this AWS cluster. And that ends up being something around in the, in the vicinity of five gigabits per second. With these nodes having 10 gigabits per second of bandwidth, that's for me, that's pretty impressive. We're nearly saturating, well, we're halfway to saturating the AWS bandwidth, um, which is which is pretty exciting. We're spending all of our time translating data instead of calculating data or transforming data, which is, again, the whole point of Aeroflight. So that's it for me. Here's some links if you want, and um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks, everyone. All right, fantastic, Ryan. Uh, so let's jump into q and I'm going to start putting people in, and uh, let's see if this works. Here comes Herman, at least supposed to be. Hopefully Herman gets added here in a second. Mm, not yet. Not sure why. Sorry, Herman. If, if you're hearing me, um, post your questions in Slack. We'll try uh, Alberto. Here we go. Hear me? Here uh, comes up. Yeah, my question is um, how this uh, arrow flight uh, could change the landscape uh, uh, of uh, machine learning platform like AWS SageMaker, for example. Um, my, my experience right now, the, the interface is just S3. And uh, I was wondering uh, if the, um, this arrow flight uh, could improve things. I think, yeah, if, um, if something like SageMaker were to add uh, support for Aeroflight, then any, any again, that's the whole point of Aero, right? We, um, SageMaker adds support for Aeroflight, and then anything who can build a flight service could, um, could send data to Aeroflight uh, to, to SageMaker. And I think given it's being sent over flight, it would be a really nice, really compact, really fast um, transfer. Thank you.
And I think Jason, you're on mute. Uh, yeah, um, thank you, great question. I just tried adding Karth, but I don't see him coming in yet. Okay, I'm gonna try Connor. Here we go, Connor. No luck so far. All right, for for other folks, if you have questions, make sure to click that you know button in the upper right to um, you know uh, enable your audio video. So that didn't work. Let's try Sebastian. It could be the folks are uh, are, are also dropping out. I'm not sure. This also just could be network issues. Okay, nothing from Sebastian. Tamarai, I'm gonna give you a try, here we go. I'll be sticking around uh, on Slack for everyone who uh, who wants to answer, who wants to ask their question there as well. Yeah, definitely, definitely go to Slack. I mean, we, even if we were able to get uh, everyone to pop up here, that didn't work, I'm gonna try David. Uh, even if we were to get everyone to pop up here, still not enough time to answer all the questions, of course. So we want um, want people to head over to Slack. But yeah, this is uh, it's it's definitely people are not popping into this thing. I'm not sure why that is. So sorry, folks. All right, I'll try Narayan. I mean, it's good that we're seeing some other people kind of like raising their hand but they're just not getting added in okay ali if you're hearing me hopefully you're like all right ready to go nope vitor That didn't work. All right, we've got two more, two more to try, and then I think it's over to Slack. Kyle. Kyle, I'm trying to add you. Here comes Kyle. All good. Um, thanks, guys. I just had a quick question for you, Ryan. Um, you were talking about using flight as a substitute for Airflow. Um, just in terms of data transfer, I know for Airflow, you write things to file, the next job picks it up, reads from file, and goes from there. If you were to use flight as a replacement, like how do you do sort of job management and structuring your overall DAG and make sure things are reproducible and whatnot? Yeah, I think um, I probably should have been more clear on that. I wouldn't um, try and replace replace Airflow. I think um, having a, a flight plugin for Airflow would probably be more sensible. So that rather than having a flight constantly read to and write from disk, you would be um, wrapping that the flight uh, the Airflow job inside of a flight service, which could then pass it on to the next step. Okay, that makes more sense. So it just yeah. handles the communication between the jobs. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm not going to go out and rebuild Airflow. Just, you never know, make sure. <laughs>